Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Sanam Lama. I'm one of the Fiji Y2s, and I'll be presenting the afternoon report today. So we'll get started now. So for chief complaint, we have a 75-year-old female uh, uh, who presented to the ED with abdominal pain. In her history of present illness, uh, so she has a history of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, left-sided breast cancer stage 2B on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, colonic diverticulosis, uh, who presented with abdominal pain for the uh, three days. Uh, so the abdominal pain, it was located in uh, her right lower quadrant. It was cramping in nature, 10 by 10 in severity and non-radiating. Um, the pain, it was associated with the fever with a Tmax of one or two degree Fahrenheit at home. Also associated with chills and uh, she did have non-body diarrhea and uh, decreased PO intake along with uh, generalized weakness. So of note in her history, uh, she presented to the on clinic uh, two weeks prior to the presentation in the ED with abdominal pain and watery diarrhea. She was treated empirically at the time for possible diverticulitis with ciprofloxacin and metronidazole. And again, uh, one week after that presentation, she again went back to the clinic uh, because um, uh, even though her abdominal pain resolved at the time, uh, her diarrhea continued and uh, she uh, she was found to have worse than leukocytosis at the time in the clinic. And uh, they thought it was a uh, possible CDF infection. So they started her on bio bank and sent for uh, CDF testing. So in her past medical and surgical history, uh, like I said before, she has um, stage to be um, her two positive ERPR negative left-sided breast cancer. And her last uh, chemo was on the 26th of October. So basically three weeks prior to her presentation. Um, and uh, she has history of primary hyperparathyroidism, uh, diverticulosis, uh, but no significant surgical history. Family history was pretty much non-contributory. Um, and uh, in terms of her social history, uh, she uh, is a non-smoker. She doesn't drink alcohol and no other, um, no illicit drug uses. Uh, she has no known drug allergies and uh, medications wise, uh, at the time of presentation, she was on PO vancomycin and uh, composite uh, PRN for nausea. So does any ha anyone have um, any additional questions in terms of her history? So based, I guess, on what Sanam has told you so far about the patient, what the patient's coming in with, the abdominal pain and the longitudinal history, um, what else would you want to know um, from this patient's history? You can feel free to unmute yourself um, or post in the chat. So Fatma is asking any sick contacts or recent travel? Uh, so no history of recent travel and uh, no history of sick contacts, no. And Frida is asking more about the recent antibiotic use. Um, I know you kind of touched on it, but I guess um, the proximity of her antibiotic use um, to her presentation. So, um, uh, so two weeks, uh, Prior to her presentation, she went to the clinic because she had this uh, diarrhea and pain, uh, abdominal pain, and then she was started on ciprofloxacin and metronidazole for like a week course. And uh, then she uh, completed that, but still after that, uh, her diarrhea persist uh, persisted. So she went back to the clinic and at the time she got the uh, PO vancomycin. So yeah. she was taking it, yeah. Um, so Shabari is asking um, food exposure. Um, I guess, what are you um, concerned about there, Shabari? Like what kind of foods are you asking about or what kind of things are you thinking of that could be causing? Anything unusual, like any canned foods or um, eating outside for like viral gastroenteritis? Okay, I don't think uh, she had any prior meals outside of her home, but... I'm not sure about the history of like uh, taking canned foods. Uh, yeah. And Anna's asking, did she also get radiation? No, she was on this neoadjuvant chemo, so no radiation. Also, uh, is she coming from home or from any facility? Uh, she's coming from home, yes. Okay. 
Okay, so I think we can move on to the review of systems and maybe physical exam. So review of systems wise, uh, so it was positive for fever, chills, uh, malaise and fatigue. Um, otherwise, she didn't have any recent, I mean, uh, so basically no rash, uh, no itching, uh, no jaundice. Uh, so she didn't have any uh, like uh, blurry vision or double vision, no uh, ocular symptoms. Uh, so uh, she didn't have any cough, hemoptysis, spotted sputum production, shown as a breath of wheezing. Uh, Yes, and um, review of systems uh, basically positive for abdominal pain and diarrhea, non bloody diarrhea, and she didn't have any nausea, vomiting, no heartburn, no hemotechesia, uh, no melena, uh, and uh, she didn't have dysuria, urgency, hematuria, no uh, increased frequency of flank pain. Yeah, so uh, for her vitals, um, uh, she was febrile uh, to a uh, temperature of 102.4 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, she was tacky to 121 bits per minute and uh, tachypneic to uh, 22 breaths per minute. Uh, and uh, BP, uh, it was 116 over 80 millimeter mercury and she was sitting well in room air. Physical exam, uh, so she did appear to be in uh, mild distress, but otherwise, uh, uh, so she didn't have any scleral icterus or no obvious jaundice. Her lungs were clear to auscultation bilaterally with no wheezes or crepes. Uh, she was tachycardic, but uh, the rhythm was regular with normal heart sounds and no murmur rubs or gallops. Abdomen, uh, it was soft, non-distended, uh, but she was tender to palpation in the right upper quadrant, and she did have mild suprapubic tenderness with no guarding rigidity. Her face was negative. Uh, bowel sounds were actually normal, uh, normal active, and uh, she had no CVA tenderness. Neuro exam pretty much non focal and extremities are warm and well perfused with, with no pedal edema, no sinuses, no clubbing, and no rashes, lesions um, on the skin. Um, so I think Amanda had one more question. Um, what new adjuvant regimen um, is the patient on? Uh, so I can, so she is on this combination of. Uh, uh, THCP. So I I think it's um, let me check. So uh, yeah. So the uh, docetaxel, carboplatin, um, and what else is combination? And uh, the paclitaxel. Yes. Hi, Sana. Yes. Um, so quick question, um, was CDF confirmed? And if yes or no, I see that she's um, on your list of medications. She's been on VENC PO 125 every day. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the correct for CDF. So she's been taking this, uh, like by the time she came to the hospital here? Yeah, so she was taking that um, uh, uh, at the time she came into the hospital. They sent the CDF testing like a week prior Mm. So it was negative. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. I see. But, so but, they, were, but they did not stop the bank PO. So when she came in, uh, after that, it was stopped. Okay. Thank you. Um. So I guess next, kind of trying to summarize the history and physical um, Sanam put together for us. Does anyone want to try um, and put together like a problem representation, kind of summarizing the like pertinent history that we got um, and how you would kind of summarize the physical exam findings as well? You can go back. Sorry. <laughs> I think Sanam helped whoever the volunteer is. <laughs> Anyone want to give it a go? Uh, I can try. Great. Uh, I actually forget her age. Um, I we think she was go. like middle aged elderly, something like that. Uh -huh. uh, female with past medical history of breast cancer on chemotherapy, um, presenting with acute, um, non bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Um, and on physical exam, she was febrile, tachycardic, and tender to palpation. And on therapy for um, suspected 
in diverticulitis with Vank and metronidazole. And I guess, how would you summarize her vital signs? So she was like febrile, she was tachycardic, she was tachypnic. Like septic? Yeah, exactly. Like, and we have a, a definite like possible source or a definite concern for infection with her with this like history of diverticulitis. And then we also have this um, like belly pain that she's having associated with it too. So I think, Sanam, do you want to show us your problem representation? Maybe yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, for problem representation, so we have this elderly female with history of primary hyperparathyroidism, left cancer, uh, breast cancer, stage to be on neoadjuvant chemo, basically who presented with abdominal pain, fever, chills, watery diarrhea with recent empiric treatment for diverticulitis and CIRF, possible CIRF. Uh, was found to be septic, febrile, tachycardic, and tachypneic, uh, likely secondary to GI source of infection. Um, so I guess at this point, based on the history and physical that we have so far, um, what differentials are you thinking of or what are you concerned about at this point? You can unmute yourself or post in the chat, but I guess what will kind of be your working list of differentials based on this patient's like longitudinal history and what she's coming in right now for. So Frida infection, intra-abdominal versus UTI, I guess what kind of intra-abdominal infection are you thinking of Frida or anyone? So cholecystitis, yeah, definitely would be um, a concern. Fatma is saying uh, infectious etiology, so bacteria, C. diff, um, obviously with that history um, and coming in with like diarrhea and belly pain, I think C. diff would definitely be a concern. If it's chemo-induced, um, definitely as well. Diverticulitis, exactly. Is this like incompletely treated diverticulitis? Um, or is this like a, a relapse again um, for this patient um, with this history having the same kind of problem again? Um, Frida saying abscess, David saying the same. What kind of abscesses are you thinking of? Or I guess, where would you go looking for abscesses in this patient? I know Frida and David both said abscess, um, but I guess we're, we're exactly pericolonic. Yeah, so I guess if it's a complication of her diverticulitis and um, that didn't like resolve if she has an abscess there. Um, yeah, opportunistic infections, Matt's saying if she's immunocompromised, definitely with this like um, malignancy history with this patient and, and like Amanda's kind of saying as well, neutropenic fever, right? We don't know um, what her Y count is, what her neutrophil count is. Um, so kind of the infections that she's at risk of or, vul or vulnerable to um, would change uh, based on that. Anything else that you would think of or that you would be concerned about in this point? I think that's like, I mean, a pretty good list for like what we're kind of thinking of. Obviously, everything very much like concentrated in the abdomen and very much like related to um, her malignancy history, her immunocompromised history, and this history of diverticulitis and C. diff really kind of going down those roads. Um, I guess at this point, if you're seeing this patient for the first time, like in the emergency department, what's, um, what workup would you do or what's your initial workup that you want to start with um, to evaluate this patient? So I guess what labs would you do first? Or any micro you would do? So blood cultures, yeah, for sure. She's meeting like sepsis criteria. So you want blood cultures, two sets um, in this patient. CBC, CMP, um, definitely want to see um, liver function as well with this patient. Um, see her BUN, see her creatinine, completing um, the um, sepsis workup, like getting a BBG with lactate. 
Um, and I see some people are bringing up like stool studies, um, GIPCR and ova and parasites. I see Shibari is on the call and I think the stool ova parasites is her current QI project. And I guess reasons as to maybe why you would or would not do that in this patient, Shibari. Um, I think it's reasonable because she's immunocompromised mm -hmm. um, with the recent chemotherapy. Um, but yeah, that was one of the uh, criteria for risk factors. And she's had diarrhea for more than um, five days, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been three days um, since admission. Mm -hmm. So she kind of meets the criteria. Mm -hmm. And I think Ro is saying a hepatitis panel, given her right upper quadrant pain, fever, diarrhea. I think that's reasonable. Um, but I guess I think initially you would definitely want to see what her LFTs are if you have um, liver derangement in that regard. Fatma saying UA. And definitely we're concerned about uh, abdominal infection and obviously completing our sepsis workup. Um, and both David and Subrat um, wanted CT abdo pelvis specifically with contrast. I guess, Subrat, what are you... Um, what are you hoping that would tell you or show you? Um, I think pericolonic abscess is something that uh, we are worried about, especially mm -hmm. with uh, uh, treatment around our questionable C. diff. So I think uh, with contrast will help with uh, defining the abscess and uh, understanding the pathology there. Yeah, exactly. And I guess the important part knowing here that like, um, especially if you're looking for abscess, that you do want contrast looking at that. I think sometimes we end up doing like a, um, maybe ultrasound um, because it's like maybe quicker, cheaper, but I think yeah, CT abdo pelvis with contrast if you have like a high suspicion for an abscess um, would definitely be reasonable. Um, so uh, Sanam, if you wanna go ahead and tell us um, like what, was, what workup was done for this patient and I guess what it showed. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, in her CBC, uh, her white count was elevated to 22.6 with neutrophilic predominance. Uh, she was anemic to 7.3 um, and uh, her MCV was 100, platelets are 460. Uh, BMP wise, uh, I would say pretty uh, sodium of 134, potassium 4.6, uh, chloride 104, bicarb of 22. Uh, BUN of 16 and creatinine of 0 0.83. So her uh, calcium, corrected calcium was 10. Uh, and we got the LFTs, yes, uh, ALT was normal. AST was like slightly elevated at 43. TBL was 0 0.7, DBL was uh, 0 0.3, uh, alt pass of 155, albumin 1.8, coags, uh, prothrombin time of 15.3, INR of 1.3 and APTT of 39.9. Lipase was Five, VVG was on remarkable with a pH of 7.4, PCO2 35, PO2 of 37, and bicarb of 20, 22, sorry, uh, lactic acid of 1.2. And EKG just showed sinus tachycardia, UA was positive uh, for leukostrates, uh, mainly WBCs and bacteria. Uh, but later her urine culture uh, showed no growth and blood cultures also uh, showed no growth. And uh, I didn't put uh, the test in here, but her hepatitis panel was also negative and stool studies like GIPCR was negative and it was negative for ova and parasites as well. And after that, uh, the team got uh, right of the quadrant ultrasound for this patient. Uh, so um, in her bile duct, so basically no biliary ductal dilatation, uh, dilatation was seen gallbladder, like no gallstones, no evidence of cholecystitis, um, pancreas, pretty normal, uh, kidney, right kidney with no hydro or renal stones, uh, but in her liver, so there was a, a huge uh, right hepatic mass, uh, 7.8 by 4.3 by 7.3 centimeter, and it was highly suspicious for metastasis. And after the right upper quadrant ultrasound, uh, uh, so the team decided to get CT abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast. So yes, and as we can see, um, um, there was a huge a lesion uh, measuring approximately 8.68 by 6.87 centimeter, uh, like extending over the right and uh, left lobe of the liver. And also there is one small lesion uh, uh, 1.92 centimeter um, in the inferior portion of the right lobe of the liver. So I guess um, for everyone now, I guess, what do you think based on these findings or based on the patient's history and really what's going on at this point? 
Subra, do you want the CT abdomen pelvis with contrast? <laughs> so if you see this result, then I guess, what are you thinking or what are you concerned about? Like metastasis is definitely something that comes to mind. I just don't know how it explains the diarrhea part of it. Maybe there's a link, which I, uh, I just cannot uh, think of it uh, as of now, but uh, definitely oncology consult, maybe <laughs> the next step I'm thinking about. Yeah, I think in this patient, like the, the big things that we were thinking about, like infection was kind of the main differential, but especially with her malignancy history and the kind of the proximity of it, I think that would be um, totally reasonable. And really most um, like liver lesions, um, you can diagnose um, like based on imaging, if you're kind of getting the proper imaging. So if you're doing like the CT um, or MRI and it's like dynamic and it's like a multi-phase that can help you that can help the radiologist rather like diagnose it as to is this like a benign liver tumor is it like a, a malignancy like a primary secondary malignancy or is it infectious um, I see Fatma saying it can be metastatic versus primary tumor will need IR biopsy. Um, I think in most cases with liver lesions, if you're getting like the proper study, like that dynamic contrast enhance, uh, in the vast majority of cases, they'll actually be able to diagnose it on, in those instances. It's if they can't definitively say based on radiology, then you'll go and need like a biopsy of it. Um, and Frida saying, I wonder how do they know this is not an abscess as both the liver and cancer can appear similar, may need biopsy. And then Joe is saying this patient was on neoadjuvant chemo, assuming recent diagnosis of cancer, CT tap for staging was done. And um, I guess, yeah, Sanam, do you know if she'd any, I guess, recent CT abdo pelvis done um, prior to surging treatment? Like, do we know if this is like brand new um, liver lesion? So this was a brand new, yes. So she was actually diagnosed like three months ago. And this scan actually was CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. But I just mentioned uh, that it's, uh, uh, given the findings, I just mentioned that it's CT abdomen and pelvis. But this one was CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. But she didn't have any like uh, metastatic uh, uh, findings in her chest. Okay, so this is like very new um, for her. So I guess kind of like what Frida was um, alluding to in the presentation. So if you want to go ahead, Sanam, and maybe show us the, the final CT read. Yep, so uh, the re CT read actually uh, came back and the large liver lesion uh, was highly sensitive of abscess with adjacent satellite abscess. Um, and uh, there was an abnormal thickened lung segment of the sigmoid with evidence of a small intramural abscess in the setting of diverticulosis consistent with acute diverticulitis. And also there was concern for a colovesical fistula uh, due to the diverticulitis, but otherwise no evidence of metastatic disease in the abdomen and pelvis, also in the chest, yes. All right, well, do you want me to final, move? Yeah, you can go ahead, I guess, show us the final diagnosis. All right, so our fine, oh yeah, sorry. So after this, actually, uh, since we found out that she had an abscess, so like IR team was consulted and then like they placed a drain, hepatic drain, and uh, from the like um, abscess gram stain, basically, uh, showed a gram-positive cocci in peers and chains, and her abscess culture grew streptococcus intermedius in moderate growth. So our uh, final diagnosis is uh, sepsis, secondary to diverticulitis, complicated by, uh, which is complicated by hepatic abscess and uh, full of recycled fistula in this patient. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so uh, briefly, I wanted to talk about liver abscess and specifically uh, pyogenic liver abscess um, uh, for this presentation. Uh, and uh, before going to pyogenic liver abscess, uh, so basically, um, uh, we can classify the liver abscesses into uh, like pyogenic, which is usually uh, polymicrobial, uh, so caused by bacteria like uh, gram-negative bacilli, uh, like E. coli, Klebsiella, Bacteroides, uh, which are the anaerobes, and uh, also Streptococcus species. 
and amoebic, uh, the other one is amoebic liver abscess, which is uh, caused by intima over histolytica. The third one is uh, fungal liver abscess caused by candida uh, seen in immunocompromised patients. And uh, the fourth one uh, uh, is uh, tubercular liver abscess, which is pretty rare. Uh, in terms of risk factors for pyogenic liver abscesses, uh, usually seen in uh, immunocompromised states like people with HIV, diabetes, um, someone with cancer, uh, liver transplant patients, and uh, people who have underlying hepatobiliary or pancreatic disease like cirrhosis or primary sclerosing or cholangitis. So they are usually the ones who are at risk, high risk for uh, getting the pyogenic liver abscess. And uh, for pathophysiology usually. So uh, there are different modes uh, by which the bacteria uh, can translocate to the liver. So basically uh, through the way of portal vein following uh, uh, GI tract in infections like HASA after appendicitis or diverticulitis. Uh, there could be a direct spread from biliary infections like someone with um, uh, someone after getting the uh, ascending cholangitis. Uh, there could be a hematogenous spread from seeding um, uh, in patients with septicemia or bacteremia and uh, someone who has um, uh, adjacent site infections like someone with soft panic abscess or cholecystitis, they can also uh, get the liver abscess. Uh, do, uh, and uh, so for the site, right lobe of the liver is the most common site um, to um, have this liver abscess. So some of the common organisms are uh, usually for like, um, biliary source of infection, it's usually uh, enteric gram negative organisms like uh, E. coli, Klebsiella, um, uh, Klebsiella that I mentioned before, and also enteric coci. For pelvic source of infection, uh, usually it's anaerobes like uh, Bacteroides fragilis, and uh, uh, for other intraperitoneal sources, uh, there could be uh, mixed aerobic and anaerobic organisms together. Um, in terms of hematogenous seeding, usually uh, we can see a single organism like Staphylococcus aureus uh, and also the Streptococcus species, including the um, Streptococcus miliary. And in immunocompromised patients, we can see Candida, like I said before. And for pyogenic liver abscesses, uh, usually in Asia, Klebsiella uh, pneumonia is a very common uh, bacteria. Uh, that can cause uh, pyogenic liver abscess. And I also put in the, uh, I mean, I let the uh, other types of liver abscess like amoebic liver abscess and also like some parasitic causes of liver abscess just in this slide. Um, so uh, for clinical features, uh, briefly, yeah, just like the way um, our patient presented, it's uh, the presentation is pretty much similar. So uh, people uh, will come in with uh, symptoms um, concerning for like uh, underlying infection, of course, with fever, chills, and uh, they will have constitutional symptoms like malaise, anorexia, they, they may have nausea, vomiting, uh, they can present with right upper quadrant pain and even weight loss. Um, so other than that, uh, they, they may have referred pain to the right shoulder or, uh, or to the back as well. And on exam, they may be jaundiced. Uh, uh, they will usually have right upper quadrant tenderness and guarding, and we may also find hepatomegaly in these patients. So uh, since we already uh, discussed about the workup, um, I, uh, I would like to move straight to the treatment. So. For pyogenic liver abscesses, usually it's the combination of abscess drainage and uh, the IV antibiotics. Uh, so for drainage, usually uh, it's a CT um, or ultrasound guided drainage. And uh, uh, in, um, if there is a single unilocular abscess with diameter less than equals to five centimeters, so we can choose uh, either needle aspiration versus percutaneous drainage with catheter placement. Uh, but if the abscess is uh, more than five centimeter, then it's preferable to do the percutaneous drainage with catheter placement. And uh, someone uh, with uh, multiple or multi-loculated abscesses, uh, so we can either like, um, uh, they will either have to get the percutaneous drainage or surgical drainage, which could, which could be open or laparoscopic. And for the antibiotic regimen, uh, usually the empiric regimen should cover streptococcus, enterococcus gram-negative bacilli, uh, enteric gram-negative bacilli, and anaerobes. 
So the preferred regimen is uh, usually, um, it could be uh, peperacillin tazobactam. Uh, it could be the second regimen could be tegarcillin clavulinid, uh, which I think is not available in the US. Uh, 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 and the third regimen is ceftriaxone and metronidazole. I think, uh, I believe it's the most commonly used regimen um, in our hospital as well. And uh, this patient also received the same regimen. And the fourth one is ampicillin uh, with gentamicin and uh, metronidazole. So some alternative regimens, um, um, usually we use these alternative regimens only if uh, the patient have uh, patient has allergies to the preferred, like antibiotics in the preferred regimen, or if there is concern for resistance or else we stick to the preferred regimen. So for the duration of therapy, uh, usually the antibiotic therapy duration should be for like four to six weeks in total, but uh, it can extend beyond that duration as well, uh, depending on uh, uh, so the extent of infection and also the patient's uh, clinical response to initial management. Uh, and if there is an abscess which is not drained or partially drained, then they will usually uh, require longer courses of antibiotics. So uh, for this patient, uh, since uh, when she got admitted, uh, so she got the hepatic drain placed and she was started on broad spectrum initially, uh, but later since her uh, um, abscess culture grew streptococcus intermediates, so the antibiotics were narrowed to ceftriaxone and metronidazole. Initially, the plan was to um, switch to ertapenem uh, on discharge with total of four weeks of antibiotics duration, but uh, uh, like her hospital course, like um, she got uh, when she got the repeat CT abdomen and pelvis, so there was uh, somewhat resolution of the abscess, but still like the collection was pretty persistent around the like lower portion of the abscess uh, approximately 4.1 centimeter. Uh, so also like during the hospital uh, course, uh, because she had this colovesical fistula, um, so she got the, she got uh, the urethral stain placed by urology. She had to undergo sigmoidectomy with ostomy creation and also take down a colovesical fistula. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, just I think a few days earlier, she got the drain exchange because the, the drain uh, was not putting out much uh, and there was concern for drain displacement. So uh, they had to do the drain exchange and she is still continued on the same regimen, ceftriaxone and metronidazole uh, with plan to remit the, uh, repeat the imaging later. Um, so that's pretty much her hospital course and uh, yeah, unfortunately, she's still in the hospital uh, getting the treatment for um, her liver abscess. Great. Thanks, and um, um, actually, Fatma just had one question as well. If any cytology was sent of the fluid um, to check for any like associated malignant cells? So I believe the cytology was sent, but it was negative for malignant cells. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting case for this patient. Does anyone else have any other questions, any comments um, based on this? Um, everyone commending Sanam's um, presenting skills and case. Um, first, just saying any idea what could have been done differently in this patient. Um, I'm not really sure, I guess, for this patient. It seems like they identified it pretty quickly and I guess um, got IOR to drain the abscess. So um, I'm not sure. Obviously, she had all these complications seem to be like related to her diverticulitis and I guess her underlying stage. Um, so I'm not sure um, if things really could have been done differently or if it could have been avoided, unfortunately. Oh, I guess one of the things, this is one of the things we always see as uh risk factor of diverticulitis, right? So especially when you have someone who's got recurrent diverticulitis and they were very reluctant to get surgery, you always have to warn them, look, abscesses are always a risk that you can get, whether they're in the liver, whether in the abdomen, the peritoneum and stuff. And that really changes your, you know, kind of long-term outlook if you get one of those compared to you get your first episode, you get antibiotics, you go for a 
localized resection or something, which can really, you know, change your outlook. So I think, you know, a lot of times people will have multiple episodes of diverticulitis. They do fine on antibiotics and they don't want to get surgery. And every once in a while, you're going to have someone that goes this way, which then really shows that, you know what, you don't want to have more than a couple episodes without getting surgery. Everyone gets one episode, right? Um, and I think Fatma just wrote 50% of cases with pyogenic liver abscess have negative blood cultures. I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but I think that sounds about right. I know in most cases, um, they say that they are like polymicrobial um, anyway, and obviously needing like um, a sample of like the aspirate to really like definitively treat and narrow your treatment um, would make sense. And Faris is saying maybe we should push for surgery more in some sense. I mean, I think of people that have recurrence, absolutely. Again, everyone can have one, and some people never get another one. But you have these other people, and especially when it's a localized area of the colon, right? If you do a CAT scan and you see diverticuli throughout the colon, well, then that's a little hard because you can't take out their entire colon. But if you see it's just left-sided or right-sided or on a colonoscopy later, it really is shown to be a very localized segment. You know, now when they can do the surgery as an outpatient, connect them right back when they're not ill, you really should try to encourage people. And I've had a couple of people where they just didn't want to get the surgery and they've ended up with drains and other, other problems. And then they wish they had gotten the surgery. 